right here and now we have Tim Blacksmith. Greetings, Kwame. Tim Greetings Blacksmith. Everybody. Welcome. Tim Blacksmith. So, welcome. welcome. Great to see you all. I wish we were in a venue where I could see everybody's faces <laughs> out there. You know, I really do miss that. I know, it's true. But, you know, listen. Do, do you know, the funny thing is, I will say this. Doing it this way uh -huh. has, has actually, as always, you know, because you stretch yourself, right? And, and by yeah. stretching yourself, you just learn these new things. And yeah. uh, I, I will repeat, you know, Nikki Charles, when we were sat there around the table going, okay, this was, you know, back, way back summer time, we were just kind of going, well, hopefully the second lockdown, blah, blah, or they won't happen. And what we'll be able to do is, and then we all looked at each other and we were like, there's going to be a second lockdown, isn't there? We're like, there's going to be. This is pre, before the government said anything. And we just said, what are we going to do? And Nikki just said, virtual, innit? Those two words, virtual, innit? Small acorns, big trees, and here we are. You know, having put together our first one with, with a great, I mean, our online team are incredible. Yeah, I love the last panel. The yeah. last panel was fantastic. You know, um, what, what the brothers and sisters were discussing there are so vital for anyone starting a business. It's extremely vital, you know, um, that you have that sense of understanding. And I love the part where the brother was talking about you know, okay, you didn't get the job. Why didn't you get the job? You know, so you're able to learn from that experience and to build on it. That's great advice. Those are gems. Yeah. I mean, we've had, we've had dreams. Hey, listen, audience, tell me this. If you can remember a few, we'll, we'll, and we'll shout, we'll shout you out as well. If you can remember any of the big statements that have been throughout this weekend, don't be afraid, just drop them in the, uh, in the side chat, in the side chat there, you know, we might read a few out because there's, I know, Mashwork was such a brilliant, hashtag Mashwork from Muna, brilliant. But yeah, there was like, don't be a wanker was, <laughs> that's another one. But yeah, anyway, look, people. Well, we got people on here who remember my, my <laughs> remix for um, Mystique, who we were just talking about. Listen. Wow. People, listen, we've got peeps here. We've got peeps. We've got peeps. Wow. People done their people have done their homework, brother Kwame. Indeed, <laughs> indeed, 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 indeed. There you go. If you're not terrified, then you're doing the wrong thing. I remember that one. Mm -hmm. What is not for you will pass you by. Will not. Sorry. What is for you will not pass you by. Exactly. That was true. Natalie will. Very true. Okay. So wow. Let's begin at the beginning. Okay. Oh. Let's start. Tim, what was your first job in the music industry? Tell us about the 16 to sort of 18, 19 year old Tim. 16 to 18, 19. Well, it starts earlier than that, actually. I cut my first record when I was 14. Hey, okay. Um, yeah, my dad bought me a drum set when I was about 12. Yeah. And I put it in the house. And I used to drive my mum and dad round the bend. So my dad found a friend of his whose son had a band. And it was a reggae band. It was a lover's rock band. And so the drums got exported over to Greenwich. And I ended up playing in this band. And um, two years in, the bass player, who was like the leader of the band, was like, yeah, I think we're ready. I think we're ready to record. I was like, what's that? And he goes, just meet me here. So I ended up at this studio called Gooseberry Studios. And it was underneath a Chinese restaurant. Okay. In, in um, Chinatown. And in the corner was this drum set, mic'd up, headphones, put it on. And like anyone who's ever experienced hearing themselves come back in a set of headphones for the first time, it was love for me. I was like, yeah, this is what I want to be doing. And anyway, three weeks after that session, sat at home having Sunday dinner with the parents. The record comes on the radio. 
And that feeling was incredible. That's that feeling that was like, yes, this is what I want to do. Through trials and tribulations, this is where I want to be. So through that, that led on to me, you know, doing lots of sessions, a majority of sessions. And um, I was always working with different people throughout the Lovers Rock scene at that time in the UK. So people like Carol Thompson, Karen Wheeler, I all did, I did sessions for them. And um, through that, I met a lot of people. You know, I met Cleveland Watkiss, who's an incredible inspiration to me. I met Courtney Pine. I met all of these incredible musicians on that journey as a 15, 16 year old, you know? And then when I was 17, I ended up doing sessions down at um, St. Peter's Square, which was the original home and offices for Island Records. And at that time it was still owned by Chris Blackwell, but they had a studio manager there and his name was Trevor Wire. And Trevor said, I like what you're doing, Tim. Come and do some days down at the studio, which then introduced me to um, an engineer by the name of Godwin Logie. And Godwin again. Godwin uh, Logie, wow. Yes, Godwin Logie was a fantastic inspiration to me in my life because he showed me you need to be organized. Yeah, you got to do this, you got to have this in place. But what I learned very early from those experiences were how important it was to have great people around you. I didn't know it at the time, but to have people around you who would encourage you, even when you were not on top of your game, they would still encourage you. Some of these people are still with us, some of them are not, but there's not a day that goes by where I don't think about them because they really ultimately gave me that impetus to still be here 30, 40 years later, still being involved in music and still loving it. So those were the early transitions into music for me. Um, my brother, Carl, we started out making ideas in our bedroom. My dad, again, bought us a, a small four track recorder. And on this four track recorder, we would put all of our ideas down. And we learned very quickly how to compile ideas, how to do demos. You know, um, four track machines at that time, the task cam at that time, it worked on a cassette. Yeah. But we managed to really get an incredible sound from these demos. So, Again, really honing your craft and learning very quickly how to bounce, how to put ideas together, you know, um, aided us in our trajectory in the music business, especially in the recording sides of things. Okay, so this is, this is good. You're taking us on this journey, right? So where we are now, is the whole thing is now is what do you consider to be your first this is a big question breaking record what did you what do you consider to be your first breaking record that first record i ever recorded that was my first breaking record because that gave me the confidence to go on and do more um yeah. And then we had a, 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 a hit with a cover that we did as a group, and it was called Funky Sensation. And we right. did it for this sound system called Soloid, who was very big at that time. He was very, very big um, in the reggae world. But this was an R&B record we were making. 
Right. So we made that record. And then after which, um, I made another record with another friend. Um, and we created this group called The Beat Lads. And I was heavily influenced by a night at the fridge where Tim Westwood was playing. Mm -hmm. And Westwood played this record. And the record was called Top Billing by Audio 2. And this beat, you'd, I'd never heard a beat like this before. If yeah. you, it, guys, do your research on it. But it was produced by a, a guy called Milk D, who I'm good friends with now. But that record there, I was like, oh my God, that beat. And I remember going back to the studio, our little makeshift studio, and recreating that beat. And that beat then led on to this record called It's You. And... You mean that beat? Listen. <laughs> it's even more incredible. And this is why I love music. Eventually, like 10 years later, I get to meet Milk D. And yeah. I get to meet his father who is one of the pioneers in independent record labels. He had a label that had everyone from, of course, Audio 2 to MC Light and everybody else. And, and yes, as, our, as one of our um, listeners is, 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 is saying, you know, Mary, Mary J, Jane, real love. Hey, listen. That's why I love music. But I remember at the end of the night going up to Westwood and saying, yo, Tim, what was that record? He goes, what record? I said, the record that went, oh, 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 And he was like, oh, that's audio too, top villain. And that really made me resonate with music and I remember going to Red's Records the next day and buying that record and studying it and uh, so anyway we made this record called It's You Beat Lads me my brother and a friend from school and I started to shop the record and um, I actually got a deal for the record it was a guy okay. called Julian Palmer oh. yeah Okay, Julian. let's let's link let's link the audience to this now. Yeah. So you're talking. This is a guy called Julian Palmer. Yeah. He was at Island Records at the time. Was it a division of Island Records? Yes, it was called Fourth, Fourth and Broadway. Broadway. Yeah. Right. Okay, so audience, if we're gonna link now, so let's get the date of that roughly. Tell us what roughly when that was. Just the year. Just give us the year, even roughly. It can be two years out. I don't mind. 19, wow, 83, 84? 1983 or 84. Something like that, yeah. Fast forward now to what, four years ago? Five years, four years ago. And Julian Palmer starts, signs a new guy that has been trying, trying to, to, to get his skills out there. A new guy called Rag and Bone Man who has obviously since gone on to do, and that is obviously now. So you're talking from there to now. That is one person's journey in music. Absolutely. Absolutely. And Julian also signed, you know, The Wild Bunch, which then went on to become Soul. Nelly, Soul. Nelly Hooper. Yeah, became Massive Attack. Uh, he also signed Misha Paris who I did a lot of work with as well. Okay, yeah. people, let's give it up for Julian Palmer. Write his name in the side there. Come on now, give him some side credit, love. Julian Palmer, come on. Absolutely. And so, um, and so that was my first experience of being involved in a major label situation. Unfortunately, the record wasn't a hit and my relationship with Julian what didn't go great. Um, however, I met some fantastic people 
on that journey, again, I met a very, very, very young Darkus, um, who now runs Island Records. I met a very young Darkus. I met people like Jumbo, who was bringing through all of these incredible African artists, such as Salif Keita, such as uh, Yusun Ndour. So I met all of these great people. Oh, wow, you found it. I see you, Janus. Okay, let's keep this rolling. Yeah. I know people's like, what is that record? I'm telling you. So it's the Beat Lab. It's, it's you, right? 19, it's written here as 1988. Okay. Wow, so there we go. There we go. Yeah. You got to forgive me. It was such a long time ago. But Come on, don't even worry. Let's keep it rolling. I'm loving this. Incredible journey again, meeting people. Um, and then after that, um, again, that was one experience. And then on that journey, um, I met a young man by the name of Dave Durrell. Oh, okay, yeah. okay. On that journey. Yeah. Dave at the time was having a massive record called Pump Up the Volume. And it was him and another guy called CJ McIntosh. And he heard our music and he liked what we were doing. He goes, you should let me manage you. So I was like, okay, I don't have any problems with that. And at that time, this is like, you know. Listen up, UK, it's time to show local business. Woo! Okay, go on, carry on. Like seven or eight months later. And again, heavily influenced by the music that was around at that time. Yeah. There was a lot of garage music at that time, a lot of strain, a lot of real uplifting house music coming out of Chicago. We put our first few ideas together. We went and we played them for Dave. And Dave loved the records. He was like, I think I can get you guys a deal for this. And we were like, yeah, okay, whatever. We didn't think much of it. And then about two weeks later, he goes, listen, I've got a deal you guys we was like really with who he goes pete tom and we were like okay what's the label he said it's ffrr which we knew because a lot of our favorite house records from out of chicago have been picked up by pete and um that led on to blacksmith and our first release at that time was a record called get back to love um again Another fantastic experience. I got to meet some incredible people who I'm still good friends with now and still do a lot of business with now, especially Nick Raphael. Um, Nick was working in the post room when I met him. He now runs Capital Records UK. And we've had tremendous success together with Sam Smith, who I publish. And um, again, how journeys are incredible. I also met um, my dear friend and business partner, Danny D. And Danny at that time, he had a group called Demo, And he was just coming off a huge record with Kathy Dennis called Coming and Get My Love. So, you know, the music journey that I've been on that, up, up until that point had been filled with just meeting really great people, people who had a real sense of character, you know, they were characters. So the person who ran um, FFRR and London Records at that time was a gentleman by the name of, um, oh my God, it's just gone black now. It's his name, Roger Ames. Roger, Roger Ames. Roger Ames. And he was okay. So, people, if you're fast forwarding, you're going now. Where is Roger Ames? He's a black butter. What did they do? Rudimental, am I right? Exactly. And Roger started London Records, and Roger was a Trini. I'm of Jamaican descent. So, the conversations were always about cricket and about what's going on with the West Indies. Here we go. Demob, smash. 
But before that, we have a record called Acid. Him and wow. Gary Hackman. Massive. Acid was huge. It was, it, it was an incredible record. So my journey has been one which has been filled with um, small deals with majors, only two, but the remainder of the deals I did myself, were independent, you know? Um, and I learned that experience from working with a lot of the reggae artists I was working with at that time because there was not really that much of a uh, marketplace within majors for specialist music like reggae. So you had to do it yourself. So you had to create the labels yourself, press it yourself, stick it in the back of the car and sell it. And there were great people around at that time like Jetstar, who if he liked the record, he would really help you to you know, distribute it, get it to radio, might give you a little bit of money for marketing. So that was my journey up until that point, Kwame. Yeah. So the real thing here, and I know there's a lot of people that's gonna to wanna to know. Come on now. Wow. I know what's going on. I know, come on, let's go. Great memories. You know, one of the things about being a producer and being involved in music is that you hear every single nuance. And even to this day, I can't remember how long ago that record was. What year was that, Kwame? Well, is all I can say. I can't listen, I can tell you now. I know it was 90s. And I think, I couldn't even tell you. 1990, wow. Yeah, and I know it was 90s. I think it was 91, I think. Okay. I could be wrong. It's a terrible affliction when you're a producer, musician. Yeah. Because when you hear work that you've done, be it in a car, be it on the radio, you are so analytical. You analyze everything. You're like, oh, man, why didn't I put that drop in there? <laughs> Please, oh, come on. Man. Why did I leave that high hat level there? Oh, it's, it, and it's really, it's really interesting because you're never, ever satisfied. Never. Even when people are coming up to you and they're like, yo, that Karen Wheeler record or that Salt and Pepper record or, or that, you know, Junior Kingdom record. Oh man, great records. And you think, mm, yeah, okay, thanks, man. But in your hearts of hearts, you know, you can do better. It's a terrible affliction. Terrible affliction being a musician and producer because you're never ever happy. You never are, you know? But those were great times. I went to school with Karen Wheeler. Um, and Karen then had an innate style. Her vocal was incredible. She sang in a lover's rock group that we all loved uh, called Brown Sugar. And um, I actually did a solo record with her called, um, it, it was under the name of Melina Caron. And it was a song called um, Special Kind of Love. And that oh. record, I don't know if you, if, if you got it there, Kwame. And that record there was, a real fantastic experience because it was produced by um, two people, uh, a guy called Noel Salmon and also Godwin Logie. It came out on Godwin's label and it was also produced by a gentleman by the, uh, who I used to call Mr. Lover's Rock. And he was called Mr. Lover's Rock because Virtually every Lover's Rock record that ever came out, he played guitar on. And his name was Alan Weeks. And Alan had me as a teenager coming down to do reggae sessions for him. Um, and I used to bunk school to come and do reggae sessions for him down 
in Bethnal Green uh, at a studio called Easy Street Studios. Again, just a, a whole plethora of amazing people that I met as a young man at that time. And, and I can't stress it enough how important. Okay. I got to cut the drums though. You hear those drums? I heard the drums, man. I was <laughs> waiting to hear the drum. <laughs> I just wanted to hear the rakatum. <laughs> Listen, come indeed, on. Indeed. Let's keep indeed. it moving. Let's keep it moving. Let's keep it moving. Otherwise, Nikki and Andrea are just gonna be like, Kwame, you didn't do this. Okay, so let's keep it moving. Okay, so people, what we're really the by showing you what's going on here and playing the various excerpts from Tim's life is not just me doing it because, I mean, I do love music and that, but it's also to show you the progression because obviously you heard his early record and then what you go to is you end up with the sophistication of Karen Wheeler. Now, the simple thing here is a lot of Tim's story, right, as you can tell, as he keeps saying, is all around it's all based around, like a lot of it is the people that he is in and around. If you notice, I mean, he's there, he's talking one minute, he's talking about Julian Palmer. As we said, Julian Palmer, this is from back then, has gone on to become the a &R man for Rag and Bone Man, right? Then you talk about Nick Raphael, who, as we know, we had him at the seminar, however many years ago, is now Capitol Records went on to um, sign a Jay-Z licensing for Europe, right? As Sam Smith has gone on to do that, which of course now Sam Smith is published by Tim, okay? Karen Wheeler, that vocalist, by the way, he was talking about. So come on, that's what happened with Karen Wheeler. So you're beginning- I've got to interject there. I come want to on. tell a story about that song. Yeah. So Karen, up until that song, she was in a famous uh, backing Mega. group of singers. Yeah. And they did everyone. They did yeah. everyone. Free Nelson Mandela for the specials. You know, they sang with everyone, you know. And Karen had become a little bit demoralized. Yeah. Where her career was going. And hold it here, Tim. This yep. is a very, very important point. It's at the last point. She had become, it's very well known, she had become demoralized. She had been done over-sessioned, as it were. Yeah. And she had literally come up against wall, against wall, against wall, against wall for yeah. her own progression. And yeah. then, go ahead, take it from here. And I remember going around to her house to see her. She didn't live too far from me over in Dulwich. And she was demoralized, you know, she was really low. And she said, Tim, this is my last session. I've got one more session coming up and it's gonna be my last session. And I was like, Karen, don't say that. And she was like, yeah, no, nah, um, you know, I'm really over it and um, look. And she went to a drawer and she pulled out a Sainsbury's application form. She was going to go and work in Sainsbury's. That's how demoralized she was. And anyway, long story short, the last session she did was keep on moving. Come on. Is that to say, that is to say, even when you're at your lowest ebb, lowest ebb, you want to knock it on the head, that's the time you've got to keep on going. And an and, and, and apt title, keep on moving. What can I tell you? And, you know, Jazzy was someone that I knew. I used to go down to the company store and sell him my records. He used to buy records from me, Jazzy. And, yeah. you know, Jazzy was one of those people as well who, to me, was an incredible um, mentor in my life because I saw what he had set up in the heart of Camden and he had people coming from all over the world. Oh. Japan, France, Holland, to buy his T-shirts, to buy, you know, and, and really soak up that culture. Let's be real. His was, was a blueprint for a lot of people. 
absolutely. Of, no, no, no. Don't just look at. Let's look at what we've just had. We've just had a, a whole sort of marketing, uh, uh, an, an entrepreneurial uh, panel, right? And we've come into this. You see, people, we think about what we're doing here. It's like, yeah. and we've come into this, and there you go, Jazzy B. Mm -hmm. ends up being at the heart of a very entrepreneurial venture called Soul to Soul, which was DJs. It was a store that sold T-shirts. Everybody wanted the, one of those funky dread T-shirts. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Come on. Absolutely. I remember the actual turntable mats as well. Come because on. Turntable mats. I turntable mean mats, T-shirts. They even went into trainers, I think, at one time. Yeah, it was iconic. It was iconic. The whole thing is all together. And then and then the records took off, and the records took off so much that they had to dash the store and just focus. Yeah, no, and and um, it was a true collective, as he used to call it. It was a real collective. Okay, so what we're going to do now is we're going to take a leaf out of the Michael Jordan documentary. We're gonna do a bit of this and a bit of this. So, Stargate. Mm -hmm. How? When? Why? Okay, so um, my journey as a remixer, as Blacksmith, started to really take off. I remixed a record called um, I'm Going All The Way by Sounds of Blackness. Come on, man. And, um, I remember it so well because I was going through some real dark times at that period. Business yeah. was down and um, I was facing a real challenge with, um, with the tax man. And along comes this record. And a friend says, you got time to mix it? I said, yeah, I've got time to mix it. Anyway, lo and behold, the record shows up. I listen to this record. It's incredible. Yeah. I mean, it was uh, Anne Nesbitt yeah. singing the song, which was virtually telling me <laughs> what my life needed to be at that stage. Yeah. This is, this is why I, I will always say music is karma related. Yeah. Anyway, long story short, we did the mix. A and M loved it, but then said they didn't have money to pay us. So, oh, we we've heard it. that. Long story short, two days later, get a call back. Jimmy Jam, Terry Lewis are going to pay you out of their own pocket for this mix to go ahead because they love it so much. And this Let's is the thing. Let's be real here. This is the thing. Often there I'm are many, business. there are many times where you have to. A person has to do that to prove, you know what, I think this is going to work. That thing of, you know what, I'll just pay for it myself. I know Nicky and Andrew hate me saying that. But so, that me and Terry paid for it. And with that money, money, we paid off the tax, man. And we were good. The record took off and I got inundated with work. You know, my saying is, I had four years of famine and I had four years of plenty. And so anyway, long story short, um, I couldn't do all the work. So I started bringing on other people who I knew who were equally as talented. Yeah. And I would say, listen, I can't do it, but I have people who I think are good and they should do it. And that's how I stumbled into producer management. So people like Booker T, people like Brooklyn Funk, people like Steve Anthony, all of a sudden we had this thing going on. Yeah. So long story short, a friend reached out to me and said, I got a guy in Norway who wants you to mix one of his records. I mean, okay, cool. Um, so he reached out and this guy's name was Tor Eric. And Tor at the time was head of A&R at uh, Warner in Norway. And he sent me this record and I loved it. It was a young uh, sister and I thought the record was great. So anyway, long story short, I hit him back. I said, yeah, I'm up for doing it. But the way I work is, you know, I don't just do one mix. I want to do two or three songs. 
So he was like, okay, cool, but you haven't heard the other two songs. I said, I don't need to. I really like the artist and I want to build. So I did the mix and he came over, heard the mix, loved it, and then said to me, you know, we're making an album. Do you want to get involved in the album? Right. This 1998 now. Yeah. And, and I said, yeah, sure, I'd love to. And um, he said, well, it means you've got to come to Norway. I said, that's cool, no problem. Because I'd been traveling a lot then anyway. I'd been going around Scandinavia, meeting different people. Yeah. Which is another key to your journey is being able to travel. And anyway, um, I end up in the far north of Norway in this really great studio. I mean, they had it on lot. They had Pro Tools, which at that time was very, very, very expensive. Um, but anyway, I liked what they were doing and we ended up making this album. The album was great. We had a lot of fun and, um, one of the guys said, Hey, I want to play you some of the records we've been working on. Someone's asking and, is that Trom song, they said. And they no, it's in, um, uh, Trondheim. 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 Not far from Trom, sir. Tromsø is a further north, but it's Trondheim. And um, long story short, it was an incredible experience because these guys started playing me music and the melodies were incredible. And they said, would I be interested in managing them? And I said, yeah, I'm up for it. But you got to know under these conditions, one, you're not going to see much of your girlfriends. Two, I'm going to need you to put as much time in as what I do. And then three, when the money comes, be good with it. Don't be silly with the money. Mm. And I returned back to England and I called my good friend, Danny. I said, yo, Danny, you know, we've been looking for something to work on. He went, yeah. I said, I think I found it. And he came down to my studio in Brixton and I played him the music. And Danny looked at me, he said, where are these guys? I said, they're in Norway. And he was like, Norway? I was like, yes, Norway. This is very uh, Danny. By the way, for people that don't know Danny, this is very Danny. So where Danny, are, yeah. As in acting like that, like, where are these guys? <laughs> <laughs> and so imagine him saying that. Okay, so, let's keep it moving. Good. When can we go? I said, mate, we can go tomorrow. So anyway, we end back up in um, the north of Norway. And Danny hears the music. And Danny's like, Tim, I've got a project these guys should work on. And I was like, okay, cool, let's do it. And he was like, yeah, yeah. Um, and Danny at that time was managed by a very, very famous um, very, very famous uh, manager called uh, Simon Fuller, who had Spice Girls, who had created, you know, um, American Idol, all of these great things. And- All he, linked with London Records, of course, but carry on. Yeah, so he puts this rec he puts this project together called S Club 7. And then he says, yo, Tim, Stargate guy should do it. Uh, Simon wants me to do it. I'm just going to call Simon and say, look, I've got other guys who can do this. And long story short, that was the journey for the beginning of my relationship with Stargate. Purely through music. It wasn't a, um, it wasn't a business venture. It yeah. was just through that connection of music. Yeah. Okay. So at this point now, they do the S Club 7. Let's just jot along to, so they go S Club 7. Let's, let's just chart the trajectory. So S Club 7, what happens after S Club 7? What's the next few things that they do? After S Club 7, we meet a guy called Hugh Goldsmith. Aha. Uh -huh. Innocent Hugh, Records. Yes, Hugh again. Another great early person to meet on the journey. Yeah. He says, love what you're doing. I've got this new boy group I'm starting called Blue. Would Blue. the guys like for doing it? And yeah. I said, why not? Send it to us. 
sends it. I send it to the guys. The guy says, we love it. We fly them up to the north of Norway. Blue are there and they're working. The rest is history. Again, those early introductions of meeting people, key, you know, and also doing right by people, very important, that you handle your business right. Yeah. Um, and so first record, fly by, smash. We don't look back. And then it just snowballs from there. Okay, so again, so they, they have this, if I'm right. We go fly by and then what's next? And then for a while it was like literally it was a blizzard. Yeah. And it was then, a blizzard. Like there was a time Stargate, you you know, they would be doing some remixes and blah and this and that. Often let's be there was a you know, there was a time I know because there was that time where you had C and J, you had Stargate, right? You yeah. had Blacksmith. Sometimes I think you might have all been on one record at the same time. Very true. Right? you know, remix wise, because there was a whole group of remixes and stuff, you know, um, you had crews that were remixing as well. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. um, and there's, you know, it's a few basically that were all remixing at the same time. Yeah. And Booker T, Booker T doing those big speed garage mixes as well. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. So then you've got be exactly Booker T definitely. So, yeah. They've done blue. What then happens next? After that, um, we did this one mix. We then meet um, at that. Sorry, at that time, I was then doing a lot of records with um, Billy Graham. Yeah. Over at Telstar. Indeed. Billy comes to me and he says, "Tim, got this girl group called Mystique." Come on now. Be Come on. up. We're working with Mystique. And I said, yeah, why not? And again, we fly them up to the north of Norway and they come up with this record called Scandalous, which okay. I'm sure you've got there. I'm not even going to because Nick and Angel kill me. So let's keep it moving. <laughs> and that record partially crossed over to the States. And then we started getting people from the States coming and asking, would we be up for working with some of their artists? And on okay. that journey, we started getting American artists to come and work with the guys. So I was bringing in people like Beanie Man. Can you okay. imagine? I brought Beanie Man all the way from Jamaica up to the north of Norway. Um, it must have been cold. Oh yeah, it was cold then. It was really cold then, but um, because of my Jamaican upbringing, I knew who he was and I loved the experience. We came up with a great song together and then we brought up uh, Marshall Mantano. Mm -hmm. uh, we brought um, so many people um, and through that experience, yeah. we got to really start make making connections with the US side of things. So, you know, um, it was just one of those great journeys. And then, you know, um, we also brought through Jay Sean, yeah. who again was going through uh, Billy Grant again, because Billy was managing one of the main producers for Jay Sean at that time. Okay. Um, and then through Billy, again, through Billy Grant, I meet a young man by the name of Craig David. Mm -hmm. And I remember it like it was yesterday because everybody was talking about Artful Dodger. Everybody was talking about, you know, um, Craig David. And I was like, hmm, okay, let's see what this guy's got. So we hired this studio called The Dairy over the back of Brixton. Absolutely. Do a mix for him. And we needed him to revoice it. And I'll never forget it, because Craig came in, he'd never heard the beat before, loved what he was hearing. And Craig just sang this song from top to bottom. 
not once, but twice. He sang it down and I was like, oh my God, this kid's the real deal. Yeah. And, and you know, that was like, you know, part of those early introductions to people who, again, you know, you just kept them in your mind and would always reach out to you because why? Because you did your business right. And that's a key thing. You always do your business right. You never know who you're going to meet. And you know that old saying, same people you meet on the way up are the same people you see on the way down. So culturally, um, at that point, things were really taking off for us on all sides. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, the guys started, the Stargate guys really started to do more in the UK, but we started to reach a glass ceiling in the UK. Tim, at this point, I have to say, I remember having a conversation with you and you going, Quam, we're gonna go States. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you're like, yeah, you're like, we can't do much more here. I so remember. There's two people I remember having that conversation with, right? Honestly. Yeah. And UK, I don't want you to feel offended when I say this, but you were one and the other was a young actor called Idris Elba. He said <laughs> exactly the same thing. He yeah. Said, Idris, we were at Finsbury Park. We were walking down the road and Idris just went, come on. I'm gonna go to States. I'm gonna go to States. He's like, there's not much more. I can't really, you know, the parts I want, I can't really get here. So go ahead. Yeah, explain, so explain that decision. The, the, the decision came about because of a conversation that had gone on between myself, Danny, and a certain person who was uh, a big radio plugger at that time and said, Tim. Danny, you need to hear this. I've just come from Radio One and the head of programming at Radio One said, if he hears another Stargate record, he's not gonna play it. Oh, what's that about? Yeah, well, you know, small minds, you know. <laughs> yeah, small well, we've minds. heard about, listen, we've, we've heard about that during this, have we not people, put, give me an amen at the side, please. Give me an amen at the side. We've heard about, what we've had is we've heard about small-minded people that try and hold others back because their vision is not as big. But I always had that vision that, you know, the guys could do really well in America because of their melodies and yeah. how melodic they were. Yeah, absolutely. So um, in 2004, we all met up in a beautiful part of Norway called Molda. And Mulder's very famous for a very famous jazz festival it has. And the jazz festival is called the Mulder Jazz Festival. And that particular day, they had Stevie Wonder playing. So we met in this, before we went to see the show, we all met and I said, guys, this is what I wanna do. I want us to, you know, go to New York next year. I'm gonna book a studio for two weeks. We're gonna get some writers in the room and let's see what we can do. The guys weren't too infused. They didn't think anybody would be really too interested. But myself and Danny, we felt it could work. So we ended up at this fantastic studio. It's no longer there now. It's a Sony studio on 54th and, 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 and 10th. But not only was it a, a recording studio, it was also a TV studio. So while you were sat in reception, right, you would see everyone come through. You'd see Lionel Richie, you would see uh, Beyonce, you would see Jay-Z, you would see LL Cool J, you would see everybody come through, you know? And it made me realize that we were within touching distance of greatness. Yeah. That told me we were in the right place. At the right time, doing the right thing. Very tough thing to do. Yes, because at that time, 
a lot of producers and um, records that were big were making really hard, heavy hip hop records. Mm. Whereas the guys were very melodic, more in the R&B melody world. So at that time you had track masters, yeah. you had Neptunes, yeah. you, you, you know what I mean? You had Timberland, you know, making those incredible but hard hitting records. Absolutely. And the guy's real world was melody. So the first week, me and Danny knew it could work. Then on the second week was when those moments of epiphany started to happen. Go on. And I met um, a good friend of mine who said, you should go and see this A&R person. Go and see them. And myself and Danny, we went to see this A&R person. And it kept us waiting for two hours. And Danny Woo! was Tim, forget this, let's go. I was like, no, Danny, come on, man. We need to get people in the room with the guys. So long story short, person we came to see sticks their head out the, the door. Oh, you guys are still here. And we're like, yeah, 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 we're still here. So anyway, we go in and we say, look, really try to get some people in the room. Who do you have? And they go, well, we got this one guy we're trying to sign. He might be good. I said, have you got anything you can hear? So she plays this record. And it was incredible. I knew the record within the first four seconds of it playing. I thought, whoever's written this is a genius. This is great. This is incredible. So at the end of the record, they asked, what do you think? I said, well, whoever's written that is a genius. I went, really? I went, yes. Just from the lyrics and the melody, it's a one listen. Who is it? I said, oh, it's this guy called Neo. I said, can we get him in the room? And I was like, well, let me see. Let, let's, let's see. And I remember me and Danny, we left that meeting so infused. But more than anything, I was so glad we didn't leave. Because if we yeah. had left, the chances are we would never have heard or met Neo. Maybe our paths would have crossed, but it wouldn't have been on that particular day. Tell it. What can I tell you? Tell so it. Tell we, it. When we got back to the studio, me and Danny walk in and we see another friend. And he sat there with the chairman of his company and these two other brothers. And my friend gets up and he goes, Tim, I want to introduce you to Neo. And I went, I don't believe it. Come I on. just heard one of your songs. And he went, really? Which one? And I told him which one it was. It was a song called Lonely. And his manager goes, how did you hear that? I said, I heard it at, at another publisher. I said, anyway, why are you guys out here? And he was like, well, we can't play music because the, the, the desk in our room's broken down. So I said, well, come in and meet the guys. So on that evening, I introduced Neo to Stargate. The rest is history. From that meeting, he wrote two songs. They weren't the first big songs, but he wrote two songs which ended up on the album. And it was when we returned, we really, fired up that relationship that would go on to spawn hit after hit after hit. Yeah. So basically, uh, I want to say after six, seven months of being in America, we had our first Billboard Hot 100 number one. So the moral of the story is follow your dream. Just be that person who wants to live that dream regardless what anybody else wants to say. Even when people got you there sitting there for two hours, three hours, you know, because you're the newbie. Keep living that dream. And this is the thing we have to say to our audience, like realistically, this whole thing of would you be that person that sat there for two hours? 
Don't forget, we've got some people screaming about not being paid right, blah, blah, for an X or a Y. You're sat there without being paid, knowing that, you know what, futures might, you might get paid. And in the end, and you've told us this, let's be real, you told us this, you told me this before, you got the phone call in the middle of the night from the Stargate boys and you said, Kwame, you said, listen, there's only certain times you get a phone call like that. Yeah. It is bad news or extremely good. Yeah. Tell it. Well, I had, I, I, I had a falling out with Neo's manager in the middle of the session because the guys were actually working on So Sick at that time. And Neo's manager said, came in and went, what are you doing? We don't want any more balance. We don't want no more mid-tempos. We want up-tempos with brass. And I was like, dude, what are you doing? Don't do that. Don't come in the middle of, of the creative. Let them finish what they're finishing. Anyway, I was so pissed off, I went home. And I remember... I didn't get the call until in the morning. I got a call from Tor. And Tor goes, Tim, I think we got it. I said, really? What happened? He goes, well, remember the record the manager tried to shut down? I went, yeah. After we did the other record, which wasn't all that, we went back and finished it after he left. And um, long story short, the beauty of that was, was that they followed their own instincts. And he said, and so Tor said, Tim, the a &R guy came down and he heard the record and was like, play that again. Play that again. He said, Tim, we must have played the record about 90 times with this guy who would go on to be one of my best friends and still is a dear friend. And his name was Tyron Smith. AKA Tata. Come on. If you ever want to meet a force of nature, meet Tata. <laughs> oh my God. So, anyway, um, the guy said, Tim, you got to come and hear the record. So I went down and I went and I heard the record and I knew what it was. It was so sick of love songs. And I was like, oh my God, <clears throat> great. Okay, listen, I, I, I'm going to shut down. I'll tell Thank you what. We got to start taking questions from the audience. Do hold on, questions. hold on, hold on. I want to tell you something. Go on. Listen to those lyrics. Did you listen to the lyrics? Go on, yes. Okay. I'm going to tell your story about lyrics. This is the beauty of about music and how lyrics touch people. I remember I was coming back into the United States. And um, I was at customs. The guy looked at my visa and he saw my visa had music on yeah. it, had my company name on it. And he said, oh, I see you're in the music world. Would I know anything, you know, you, you, you guys have been involved with? I said, well, funny you should say that. We've got the number one song in the country right now. He went, really? What song? And I said, so sick of love songs. He goes, that's my wife's favorite song. There you go. Said, that's my wife's favorite song. And do you know why? I said, why? He says, because of the date that he says. The date he says in that song is my wife's birthday. Hey. How incredible it is for when you can write lyrics like that, that can touch people here. Yeah. From all walks of life, from all different spectrums of the globe. There are people in Japan who know that song, who don't even speak English, but can sing every single lyric from that song. I got, question, I, I got some quick fire questions for you, Tim. Okay, so firstly, does Tim sing still, oh, the wine's got to me. Does Tim still seek out new talent or interested in managing upcoming producers? I know you signed Menace. Also, also that produced Panda, Panda. Yeah, um, I'm definitely still interested in new talent, still signing new talent to the publishing company. Um, uh, yes, on the management side of things, not so much, but on the publishing side of things, 
Oh, 100%. Um, we've signed people like Namani. We've signed this young guy called Spain the Goat. I just signed an incredible artist called Jesse Boykins the Third. We've signed an, another fantastic producer called Jakob, who's produced everything from Black to, um, to um, Pretty Little Fears for Black and uh, what's his name? Um, J. Cole. So we are still very, very much in that world. What a tune. Come on. Look, it's, 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 it's a fantastic journey. I Come mean, on. You, Come on. You put, when you put talent that you love together, for instance, when I put Namani with Sam Smith and Stargate, the rest is history, Dancing with a Stranger, one of the biggest records of that year. Let's link it up again. Remember, people, we said Capital Records. Remember. Remember the person. You had Nick Raphael. What was Nick Raphael? T-Boy, where was he? London Records. Where was Tim signed to London Records? How far back was that? People, this game is long. People, this game okay. takes some guts. And people, okay. so don't be a wanker. Don't be a wanker because you know, don't know, if Tim had been a wanker to Nick Raphael, would this record have been made? I think not. Come on now. Absolutely not. And, you know, it's so many records with Nick and then with Joe. It was amazing. It was amazing. And we're still great friends now. And that's the key. You know, that's the key. There you go. Any more questions? All right, listen. Questions, people. How about, how important, Dylan Castell says, how important is the role of the publisher in artist development and how joined up is the working with the label once signed? So how important is the role of a publisher in artist development? Let's answer that one first. Well, unfortunately, there is no more artist development. Artist Hello. development now is coming from people like myself and Stella Songs, where we will actually sign people two to three years before they're even signed by a label. Sometimes it's the other way around, but a majority of the time, we're actually developing the producer or the writer. Yeah. So it's extremely important, extremely. And then also it's when the, when, when the songwriter and the producer get deals, it's important to introduce them to the right labels who've got the right artists um, for them to work with. Uh, you know, for instance, you know, there are fantastic people in a &R here in America doing some incredible records, you know, but they show the diligence to get young producers yeah. on board early, you know? So, that's also very, very, very important. We've got Bronna, who is saying, as a songwriter, I want to get some more sessions under my belt. Should I be contacting songwriters directly or pitching songs to, company like, to companies like Stella Songs, managers, a &R, publishers? How should Bronna go about it? Well, Bronna, my, my advice to you is, is that you should be building your own team. So if you're the producer, Come start on. reaching out to young writers who you may meet on the ground, or you may hear them do something on YouTube. Reach out to them and say, hey, can you write to my ideas? You know, because that is very, very, very important. Now, a lot of the great talent is on the ground. They're there. They're yeah. there singing ideas. I post some of them in my stories. I post some of them on my, um, on my page because it's so good. Some of it is so good. There's one, her name is Fouché. And wow, when I heard her, I was blown away and, and I put some of it up and I got a response from one guy saying, I don't normally go on the gram and check out artist but this girl is so amazing 
that it's really resonated with me. She's now signed to RCA. She signed to another dear friend of mine, Tunji. But yeah. the record she's making, check her out, Fouché is her name. She's making some great records. And then, um, so the, the, the talent is clearly there. You know, the talent is really there. Um, so again, use what's there in front of you. Sometimes it's, you know, independent people put records up all the time. Big question here from Daniel Lewis. Are you active on Instagram and have you ever discovered talent that you've taken on board directly from Insta? Yeah, of course. I'm very active on Instagram. If you know my page, I do. I'm okay. very active on it. And I post as much as I can from our teams who are making music. And I talk to lots of different people, not just in the music sphere, but in the marketing sphere as well. Also in the art world, the visual art world as well. Um, because they all come together like that. Yeah. They all do. They all inspire me with their photography or with their uh, fine art. Um, there is a real synergy there, which is being missed right now. And I'm gonna try and make that bridge between great music and great visual art. Mm, you know, mm, everybody's going through a lockdown at the moment. Yeah. But once the lockdown is over, I mm. want to recommend the show that you musicians and songwriters should go and see. It's by a young sister by the name of Toyin Oji Adotulu. Mm -hmm. And the show is at the Barbican. If you do not come out of that show, inspired to go home and write some incredible songs i'll be very surprised yeah okay um where are we i, I just guessed the spelling by the way there if i got it wrong toyin and you're watching please forgive me <laughs> yeah because enough people get money there are so many many incredible um songwriters and producers out there who live on the ground got yeah. another we got another question from Shala. What is the best way to start an independent label? The best way to start the independent label is find an artist that you love and believe in and put your money where your mouth is. Put your money where your mouth is. Invest in self. It's the best thing ever. There's a young man called Addex. And I've got to shout him up. Michael Addex. Gonna shout out, out, shout out Addix. Wow, Addix, I'm so proud of you, brother. Seeing what you're building and it's incredible. And this is what I mean. Everything starts from you. Everything starts from you having that idea and you following it through, meaning I like this tune, let me press it up. Well, it's not pressing anymore, it's now, let me put it up. Yeah. You now have aggregators who can upload your music. You never know who's gonna hear that song. We got another question, Chantel Nandy. Okay, no, Jane S. Oh, by the way, just found, Chantel Nandy has just found toying on the gram, gorgeous work. Love it, love the Adex. Estelle White says, King, uh, we've got Jane S saying, in this day and age, Jane S's question, as a new artist, song mastered, video done, where would you put limited cash? Okay, so let's, let's, let's say we've got two and a half grand, two and a half grand, right? Where would you put that money? You're an indie label, where would you put it? Where would I put it? I would be putting it into my marketing one yeah. and also finding a really good dsp plugger someone who has got those relationships with the titles with the spotify's with the amazons with the pandoras who can get me front and center or at least try to get yeah. me front and center and then yeah. secondly 
a really good radio plugger as well. I know a lot of people think radio is over, but it's not. It's still very much front and center. Um, and these are the people who you're going to build your career with, who you're going to build your ventures with. These are the people who one day you're going to bring them your third or fourth idea and it's going to go through the roof and they're going to and you're going to remember those people. Ella Trazi is asking, what is your experience with sync licensing and what advice would you give to an artist at the beginning of their career who wants to pitch their songs for sync? Good idea. Well, sync is incredibly important. Finding sync people, independent sync people is going to be key for your career, unless you already have a publishing deal and the publisher has a sync department. Um, there, are, there are countless individuals who are doing independent sync deals, but it can mean a lot because you could get a sync deal where if it's an independent song that you control, someone could come along and they could say, yeah, we want to use this. We want to use it for uh, a campaign of six weeks and we're going to pay 1500 pounds yeah. for the publishing mm -hmm. and then a further 1500 pounds for the master that's 3000 pounds yeah you can then reinvest back into your business totally yeah yeah so and by the way people very, just to say you're looking the the the, the sort of tim and Dammy, danny Blacksmith Stella songs thing, it does not just stop at finding artists. They also find great new executives. Bethany Marshall, Sony ATV. So, you know, this is the thing. It's about, they're still team building. This is what I'm saying. They're still team building people. You might know, you might not know, but this is the way. You know, and when we brought through great people as well, I've had immense pleasure of working with Ricky, Ricky Blue, and of course, Glyn. Glyn Aiken, I remember when Glyn was working with Shabs. Relentless. Always had that innate sense of hearing a hit song. Mm. Um, and then we have um, great people like Janelle working with us as well. Janelle, Janelle Fraser. Fraser. Again, Fraser. another good spot. She was working at I Love Life. Wasn't yeah. necessarily, you know, someone could have gone, yeah, but what she's doing live stuff. No, these guys single, this is Tim, Danny, they single her out and they're going to come over and she's taken to it like a duck to water and is managing the vast catalog of stellar songs to this day. And then we have, and then we have you know, um, our new member of the team, which is Sharav. And Sharav has been working with some incredible people for God knows how long, over at Two Tones, and we brought Sharav on board as well. Of course. Again, you know, we're bringing, we're, hopefully we're going to bring through some more people. There's Claire. Claire Isla has got some incredible people she's brought through for us as well. So we're really not only looking for producers and writers and, 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 and other people, but we're also looking for those next, you know, those next executives, be it in the legal side of things or be it in the, you know, sync world. We're really, we're really, we're, we're, we're really about um, bringing through new people. Because that, uh, that was me. And as I said earlier in the conversation, these people brought me through. Yeah. Okay, 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 okay. Wow. Um, so Prestige asks, Tim, did you go to Kingsdale School in Dulwich? I sure did. <laughs> I owe Kingsdale a debt of gratitude. Kingsdale uh, had a music department that allowed you to bring your records in on a Friday and play whatever you wanted to play. So because of that, I got to hear everything. So yeah. I would be bringing in the King Tubbies, Augustus Pablo, and then some of my other friends would be bringing in the Jazz Fusion, the, you know, um, the Billy Cobhams of this world. Yeah. And then there would be friends who would be bringing in 
Stravinsky. Yeah. You hear them arrangements and you'd be like, whoa. Come on. But that school, um, I had a teacher called Mary Graham. Big up Mary Graham. Let's, let's give her the... And, uh, yeah, I had a teacher called Mary Graham and her husband. He ran the big band. So for me, as a 13-year-old, hearing a 32-piece orchestra gave me so much vision and understanding. What we're talking about. Right, of how records could sound. Can't what see. a tune sounded like. What a baritone sax sounded like. The combinations of a baritone, flute, and trumpet, muted trumpet together. Um, those were very invaluable. And then they had a string orchestra. Then they had a steel band, which, you know, the guy who ran that steel band, he's passed now, but he opened my eyes as far as what arrangements can be. And again, just being around people who really can shape you and you being malleable enough to accept that. That's the big part, is keeping this open enough to accept all different genres of music, all different people who will enter your life because they will be key in your transition to greatness. Bronner, last question. Do you think songwriters need to wait until they have a guaranteed hit before they pitch to companies such as Stellar Souls? No, I think you, there's no such thing as a guaranteed hit. There's no such thing. Okay, if you got the questions, let's keep it moving. Yeah, come on guys. Dylan, what is the best way to get the very first bit of experience at a publishing company such as Stellar Songs? Intern. Intern? Yeah, okay. come on, intern. Yeah, let's keep these quick fire questions so that we can vanity okay. gold. 30 more minutes, 30 more minutes. 30 more people, you, you, you call for it. Yeah, man. Okay, so let's keep it moving. Who is your favorite tie? Damaris is asking, who is your favorite songwriter right now? Who's your favorite producer right now and why? Wow. There's a lot of great writers around at the moment. Absolutely great kids around making great songs. Uh, David and Jessica making great songs. Jimmy Napes making Jimmy great Nates. songs. Another great seminar speaker, Jimmy Napes. Yeah, Jimmy's making great songs. Uh, who else am I loving right now? Uh, Jesse Boykins has got some incredible music with another great artist called Fur, P H E R. Fur has got the voice of the gods, he's gonna be incredible. Um, I love what internet money is doing right now. On. Oh my god, how can you on. Love Man music? Man's just giving us a tip there. People, I know you're going to be listening to that person. Love music when you hear something like that. Listen, we've got Ella Strazi saying, Ella Strazi saying, this feels like such a relaxed yet productive Sunday. Thank you. We've got, yeah, it's all sorts. Wow. We've got somebody curated by Queen, Kimi Soka, saying, should I accept offers from promoters forecasting performances in a couple of months? with my ticket sales, determining the set time and set placement. The onus to keep going is great, but my gap says, meh, help. I don't think you ever give up. Look, this pandemic is really gonna set the greats among the greats. How you reinvent yourself, how you pull through this time is really going to define your greatness. There was a saying that my grandfather used to say to me, and he said, Tim, greatness deserves great sacrifice. And trust me, these battles, these journeys that you're facing now, 
this is what's going to get you through. So, yeah. you know, don't give up. Talking about other great songwriters I'm loving right now. Go ahead. By the name of St. John. I Thank met John. John five years ago in a one bedroom flat. And he had the voice of the gods then. Uh, and I wanted to sign him. He ended up going with Shani instead, my yeah. sister. Fair play, Wakanda. Well, I signed the producer who's oh. produced all the music. Roses. I mean, there we go. We've got more questions. I know, the questions are flying now. Wow. All oh, right, okay, this is a big one. Someone in the YouTube commented, I don't know who this is. I had a song to... Yeah, this is a big one. JBZ, the lad, I've, 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 I've seen this before. JBZ, the lad, it's on YouTube. Okay, we're reaching out to the YouTube posse here. And it says, I had a banger sent to a label and they said they didn't want it. A year later, the song idea had been copied. How do you avoid this and still feel comfortable to send songs to A&Rs? Well, cases like that, you really need to get yourself a musicologist. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And have him listen to both songs. Yeah. I know it's not easy, but to listen to both songs yeah. to see whether there has been an infringement of your copyright. True. And if there has been an infringement of your copyright, then you can get legal aid to take action against those people. And don't forget, there's many a lawyer, if they think they're going to win, they'll be like, you know what, let come, just cut me a little percentage and let's go. They'll do it pro bono. Yeah. So that's what you do. Having said that, I have been in, I have been in this position, JBZ, the lad, I've been in this position before. And I must say, I was just like, forget it. Because it, I remember thinking, and it's bad for me to say this, but listen, I'm not being fraudulent. I'm just, I, I just tell it like, I, like it is. Like the, the truth of it is, I remember thinking, we sent this person a, a backing a set of backing checks and clearly what they did was is they sent the backing check to a producer and said listen give me that but just give me better production on it and we'll wait and if they come for us they come for us and basically that's what they did it becomes very very difficult because yeah. we hadn't registered the backing track before we sent it out and obviously yeah. that's the trick you know yeah yeah i've had a case similar to that but they just settled yeah. yeah. But that's where your publisher comes in. True. Your publisher comes in and your publisher's right. You know, let's have a listen. Let's get it to the musicologist. You know, and sometimes you've got to get two opinions. Yeah. Very true. Um, okay, sorry. Uh, let's keep it moving. What's the best architect? Oh, sorry. Olivia Brissett says, what's the best mar artist marketing strategy you've seen? Just some examples of some. It's difficult to say the best, but. I think the current St. John strategy is fantastic. It's really good. And I'm not just saying that because he's a brother and he's a, he's a, a dear friend, but I love that strategy. And then uh, I love the strategy that um, LVRN did for Summer Walker. I thought that was great. Um, and then I liked, um, who's the brother? Um, I've liked the Storms, Stormzy's marketing strategies have been really good as well. But there's yeah. one other brother that I've liked where he sent a sax player with a red carpet to people's houses um, and handed them the um, album. Oh my God, what's his name? Heady One, that's it. Heady One, brilliant. I thought that was brilliant. Yeah. Really, really, really good. Um, and then uh, I thought the last marketing campaign for Black, the last EP he put out, where he created his own fast food store with the hot sauce and the fried chicken 
And yeah. everything. But that was fun. That was fun as well. But there's been some really good ones. And I mean, these are ideas that don't need a lot of money. These are ideas that come from here. Some of the best ones don't. Also, again, you can have you can have some crazy, crazy. Um, yeah. You know. Wow, somebody, somebody's going to me. Send me the link now. They just keep hearing about this talk. They're going, send me the link now. <laughs> like, All right. Well. Anyway. Um, so, so any, any more? Who, who else has got I keep it. I keep it rolling. I keep it rolling. I keep it I'm not going to sign the PUBG in the moment, but I don't know. Okay. I have a whole roster of artists and producers under management slash label services. None of them are signed to publishing at the moment, but I don't want them to miss out on publishers revenue. Would you recommend signing them up as rights holder or fishing around for a JV? Uh, I would say what you should do is, is probably get a good ad publishing administration. administration. Yeah. So i um, happy to help with that. Uh, if you want to reach out to me via Kwame, we can have a conversation offline. But mm -hmm. that would be the way that I would do it. I would set up a, 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 an administration service for them where you can administer the publishing for them. Because it's very important, um, as someone who started an independent company themselves, I knew how important revenue income was. So yeah. when the PRS check would drop through the letterbox, I knew, okay, okay, this is good. I can pay the mobile bill this week yeah. or this yeah. month. Yeah. Or, or when the PPL check would drop through the letterbox, as yeah. it was then, I'd be like, okay, we can press that next song. You know, life is what you make it, Karen Wheeler. We could press that song because we had that income coming in and um, just realizing also that the music business is global. Even though you may be in Streatham or yeah. you may be in Brixton, I want to give you an example of an experience. In 2018, a friend of mine came to LA with his artist and they performed at the Roxy, very famous on Sunset, sorry, not on Sunset, yeah, on Sunset Boulevard. And the young man that was performing, his name is Dave. And Dave performed a set at the Roxy, sold out, and he performed one of his songs. And this particular song had no hook. It was just straight lyrics. Every kid in that venue re recited all the lyrics back to back with him. And at the end of it, he was really emotional. He goes, you don't understand. I'm from Mitchum. I'm from Streatham. And I've come all the way here now. We're streaming. It's a different ball game. It really is a different ball game. And where it's taken us as well. And you they know. were independent. They was independent then. Yeah, very true for a very yeah. long time. You know, and yeah. his managers have sliced very, very uh, great deal situations. Cool. Well. Benny and, and Jack, incredible work. Yeah, very, very good work. Okay. This is interesting. A Tari, <laughs> that's great. Obviously, for us old schoolers, we're sitting there laughing at the complexities of that with the computer. But A Tari is asking, you have a song that uses an interpolation of another song, the lyrical hook, similar melody. Do you change the hook or root around to find whoever you need to get permission to use the lyrics? Uh, you could do both. But yes, before you release the song, you will have to clear it. You will have to reach out to the original publisher and ask them uh, for the rights to use it. They will come back with a quote to use it, they may say, yeah, you can use it, but we want 50% of the composition. Yeah. And it really does depend on how much it makes the song. If you feel that this is the song, this is it, you know, then, you know, you go with that. 
you know um there's been many 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 times where there's been interpretations where people have re-sung the hooks and those songs have gone on to be big hits you know um and they moved your moved the artist's journey forward yeah i've got by the way i'm a big fan of uh somebody who did janelle played me is it wove wow yeah wow yeah. yeah yeah she played me some stuff but and i was like excuse me i need to lie down yes like, yeah very very serious yeah, brought, brought, brought through by uh ashley sykes yeah and um and barry burr again two of our our real early um you know people who we we've worked with you know ashley used to work for us Wow. Okay. Um, da, 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 da. With everything being so fast paced nowadays, what will give you longevity as an artist in the music industry? Great songs. <laughs> Love it. Simple. Songs <laughs> that resonate with people right here. Okay. It's that simple. That song that you think Oh my God, I was just going through that the other day. Wow. That song where um, people come up to you and they say, oh my God, that song got me through some of the hardest times. Or we played that song at our wedding. Do you know what I'm saying? There was um, BMI, which is a big, a performance rights organization. Yeah. They are the thing, because Sting has written some of the biggest songs, you know, for the last uh, three decades. There's a, there's a, I mean, obviously, there's a lot of people asking, SJ, for instance, what's the best way to build stream outside of playlists as an independent artist? How to build streams outside of playlists as an independent artist. This is quite an interesting one because there's two ways here. Now, you could, SJ could be meaning outside of Spotify main playlists, which I would say actually is a free for all and can often get you a lot further yeah. than just being in a New Music Friday or whatever. Cause we, we've seen this as a lot of people run for the New Music Friday when in actual fact, if they were going for more of the private uh, playlists, they'd actually end up with more play. So playlists. And then what about the playlists in the different territories across the world? Yeah. Colombia, Sweden, yeah. Norway. You know, people forget that it was Scandinavia that broke the streaming mold. Yeah. Norway was way ahead of streaming before anybody else. I want to say they were two to three years ahead. Because you, Norway's lad got some crazy ratio, like one in eight people are on paid Spotify or something. It's unreal. Yeah. It's unreal because Sweden and Norway were like the first real testing ground. You know, so what about, I mean, look, if you go on, on these providers, you will see that they virtually have every country that yeah. you reach out to. Um, and also, and also. Want to a suggestion. My suggestion is also outside of streaming, how about working with people who are making independent film? There's lots of people out there making independent film who need a theme song. You never know. That theme song could end on an independent film that could end up getting nominated for a Golden Globe or an Oscar. You never know. Also, I'm Brixton. <laughs> and never in my wildest dreams did I ever believe I would publish a James Bond theme. And that James Bond theme would go on to win Golden Globe and an Oscar. Never in my life. So keep in mind 
you meet someone online or they, they're making, you know, music or film or whatever it is, or programs on YouTube, reach out. Hey, do you need a theme song? Can we work on something together? Yeah. Yeah, I absolutely hear that. Absolutely hear that. We've got Sir Prestige asking, as a former remixer, Tim, should remixers today, by the way, people, this is the late night session right now with Tim Blacksmith and Kwame. Tim Blacksmith is in, where are you, Los Angeles or New York? Yeah, I'm in Los Angeles. I'm Los Angeles, in as we said, this is the international uh, virtual ultimate seminar. This is the first time we've ever done this. On the panel before, we had Sean Prez. We had people also on that line from uh, that were in Iceland. We had people that were in Chicago and New York. Uh, we've gone international this year, as you know. Tell your people, make sure all of you, please, I want two tweets from all of you about this panel and the panels that have been before, because you are the beacons for this here event. You telling people is what makes other people go, okay, well, you know what, next time I'm gonna go. You know, so that's how it works. Okay, so, so prestige. So prestige, I'm gonna say, as a former remixer, Tim, should remixers today, this is a big one, be asking for a split of the publishing for remixes they work on and can they? Well, yes, some, people, some of them do. And some of them, when they can't get uh, split of the publishing, they do get a split of the revenue. Yeah, they of the streaming revenue. You know, people <laughs> like Sieb, they get a split. If they can't get publishing, they do get a split. This is a, this is a big one. This is a very, what you've just said that, sorry to butt in, but this is a very, very big one. As in right now, because it stands to reason, and this for a lot of remixes, this is a way that they can learn their craft. It stands to reason, right? You can just approach someone and say, listen, you know, I'm a new remixer. Give me a shot at your thing. If yeah. you use it, cut me in, give me 25%. Of the uh, of 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 the master revenue, I know I said it. People are going to be up in arms on Music Week and MBW, but I'm saying it. Why not? You know what? If you're an artist, you didn't have the remix before. Now you've got the remix. Who cares if you give away twenty five percent of the master? Who can? Who cares? Because what you can do is you can register the songs as different versions. So yes, it is possible. Let's face it. I mean, you know, I've I've seen this before. You know, Starly is a very good example of this. The yeah. Ryan Reback remix, and then yeah. the original, you've got the, the original at 50 million streams right now. You've got the Ryan Reback version of what, 770 million streams, something like, sorry, 800 million streams. In fact, it's over a billion now total. So this is the situation. Yeah, and then if you look at, um, if you, Look at the St. John record, that's a prime example. Yeah. The, the Imbara remix, you know, is a billion streams plus. Yeah. Over the top. And this is the thing. This is the thing. Sorry, I'm just looking. You're totally right. Uh, one Iman Beck remix. There's a big question there, of course. Is he on a split of the master? I have the... no idea. <laughs> He's like, as publisher, I have no, no idea. idea. I have no idea. But he's like, as, <laughs> I'm not in my brother's business like that, but I have no idea. <laughs> oh. Ay, 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 ay. Okay. All right. So we've got a couple here. Oh boy. Oh boy. Okay. 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 Um, wow. Okay, inter Sophie is saying internships can be very competitive. So what's your advice in trying to get an internship with Stellar Songs or other publishing companies? Go ahead. And by the way, I just want to say one thing that I haven't said on this here call, this guy and his publishing exploits made me go, do you know what? I've got to start a publishing company myself. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> why not? And why not? That's what it should be. Mate, listen, it was it was you, absolutely. That's what like if, if you hadn't have done what you did, I would never have come across Starley, ever. 
So um, that's all I'll say. That, anyway, carry on. The simple answer to that question is be persistent. Be persistent. There you go. And have, reach be, out to all of them. So all for, of them. If Not you, the deal, Warner Chapel, Sony ATV, all of them, even the smaller ones. Reach out to all of them. Sophie, we're tiny. We're called Alive and Well Songs. Reach out to us too. We're on no. Insta. No. That's, That's how it goes, saying. man. Come on. Reach out to Merck. That hypnosis. All Merck of them. Step up. Merck's one oh. of those people he'll step up, you know? So, yeah, there's lots of people who you can reach out to. We've got, um, wow. Okay. You know what? <laughs> Okay, 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 okay. I, listen, I know there's they're still flying in. They're still flying in. Does Stella Song host urban artists on their roster? Or maybe it's just do urban artists on their roster? I'm not, because it didn't quite make sense. Is you, okay, oh, let's put it this way. Yeah, you do. Five exactly. minutes, guys, five minutes. Okay. Everything. We are across the board. Beautiful. Think musical that we, that we love, we get involved with. From you know, you listen to Ted Wen, find it, Kwame. Ted Wen, T E T E D W H E N. How can you not love music when you hear that? Come on, that man walked into our room because Lindsay. Played me and Danny two of those songs and was like, this is great. And we signed it. Lindsay's at the label. It's run by um, my good friend, Corey Smith, mm -hmm. who manages people like Dave Chappelle and, um, oh, what's his name? Vince Staples. Yeah. He's such a, a such a, a great music person. But when you hear songs like that, you just know I've got to be involved with this. This is great. So we run the gamut. We have everyone from Ted to Sam Smith to Charlie XEX to, you know, Spain the Go. It's so varied because that's been my love. My music experience has been so varied. So yeah, no, we are open to all genres of music. Wow. Okay. Well, people, that has been it. Okay. Um, I don't even, I don't even, uh, <laughs> I can see questions. People are like, oh no, I say, oh no. Yeah. Just like so solid, you know, as I was saying. Um, but yeah, I can only say, oh no, that's the word, you know. Um, it, is, that one? is there a recording for this, please? Is it for this whole weekend? You'll have to ask Nikki and Andrea nicely. There is, there is, there definitely is. So we're sorting it out. Okay, 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 okay. Um, look, folks, I'd love, I want to really invite um, uh, Nikki and Andrea back on. Um, to here right so this has been the ultimate seminar okay people i know it's been an amazing amazing week it's been great for us too honestly um i'm gonna go and chill um fact, yeah absolutely i want everybody to completely big up tim i know i can see people say tim's a legend from florence said that we've got thanks to everybody it's been an amazing weekend thanks to andrea to nikki to kwame we've got Richard Dawes from Doorbell. Listen, people, Doorbell, we have to big up, who have been absolutely magnificent, came to us and said, we will help you promote this whole event. Doorbell, we owe you gratitude because not many, not many publicity companies would have done that. I want people to put Doorbell, D-A-W-B-E-L-L, -L, -L, in the chat right there. Let them know, fire signs, emojis. Come on now. Come on, come on, yeah. 
Woo! That's what I'm talking before, about. Before you wrap up, I just want to say this to all of you. Thank you so much for putting this together. Because I was that person once in this chat or in that auditorium listening to people talk about their journeys. And I realize how important it is for people to hear your journeys so that they can understand and know that it's possible. Knowing that it's possible, this is the thing. It's all possible. This is the thing. So- Can I, can I just say quickly, and Andrea, back me up on any names that I miss. Um, yes, the company is myself, Kwame and Andrea. We've been doing this for over 13 years now, but for this year, we had a team behind us who we must also recognize. We've got our social media team. Um, so we have Andrea, take over from there. Andrea, we have Etan, we have... Annie, and we have Rachel. They've been absolutely amazing on our social media platform. We've had some great help and a new addition to our family through the uh, making of Flo and Ed. They've been helping us to stream and catching all the questions and putting it all to our panelists. So that's been fantastic. Um, thanks to Doorbell again, helping us with our PR. And do I miss anyone out? Our sponsors, who else have we missed out? Freeze. freeze, oh my God, Freeze. Helping us to do the booklet. Did somebody and say Freeze? freeze. And Flo and Ed. Flo and Ed from Flo and Ed, you've been fantastic. Thank you. From Thank Gemini, you. Flo and Ed from Gemini, it's been incredible. Um, I love that Chidi, Chidi Digital is saying not missed a single minute of the whole weekend. It's been legendary. Listen, Chidi, as I said before, two or three tweets tonight is all we ask. We saved you nine grand, right? So we, all we ask is two or three tweets from everybody here. Post it. Let them know. Let them know. Because the people that missed it, missed it. You don't get people like Tim Blacksmith. This is a person who's had serious, serious, I'm very privileged that I've even done a tune with this man, I'm telling you. But this is a man who has done serious, serious, serious. Uh, tunes, not one tune, tunes. Uh, no, that's what I'm saying, serious tunes. It's true, yeah. So, before we say bye to Tim, there was one question that came in and I think it's a really good one to end on. Tim, I can't remember who asked it, so I'm really, really sorry, but Tim, what do you want your legacy to be? Yeah, very good question. That was a good question. Uh, my legacy to be is to um, open as many doors as possible, to leave a lasting legacy that will open as many doors as possible for our young people to go forward and flourish. Antonia Carrera, Carena answered that. And not, oh, feel, thank you, Antonio. and not feel denigrated in any way, shape or form. And that they know within their hearts of hearts that there is a place for them where they can succeed because that's what it is. Yeah. It's about our young people feeling and knowing that they can succeed. It's when you reach that point in your life where you're not able to, or you feel like you can't make it, knowing that you've got a place where you can go, where you can have a conversation with someone. You can turn around and say, yeah, no, you, we can make that work. Yeah. And that would be my lasting wish for my legacy to be. Thank you, Tim. Thank you. And if we're all in an auditorium now, it'll be a stand innovation for you. Thank you so much for your time. Okay, bravo. Thank you, Kwame. Thank you, Nikki. Thank you, Andrea. And all the team. You guys do an incredible job. And I know you've been doing this for a long time. Because okay. Kwame posted a picture of me when I was a lot younger. <laughs> At one of the seminars. I keep finding them. Shots. Tim, I, is it you? <laughs> I keep finding them. I literally, it was like, I was going through my garage and it just dropped and I was like, yo. Uh, it's the honesty, but yeah. Great journey. Thank you, guys. Thank you for having Thank me. Thank you, Tim. We'll speak soon. See you soon, Tim. Bye. Bye. Bless.